Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on June 25, 2023, are from Jeremiah chapter 20, 7 through 13. Our alternate first reading is Genesis chapter 21, 8 through 21. Psalm 69, 7 through 10, possibly 11 through 15, and then 16 through 18. The second reading is our continuation in Romans chapter 6, 1b through 11, and Matthew chapter 10, 24 through 39. Yeah, this picks are. up right where last week left off. Matthew 10, 24 to 39. It kind I'm, of continues. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I'm going to, I'll say this because you might lift us up out of this, uh, but I appreciated again the commentary. Uh, that Cleo left us um, in just the recognition of the moment we contemporarily are living in. And so this this recognition of of the fact that um, there's 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 this one against the other, um, that there's this division, that there's this loss, um, that there's um, that there's chaos again. Uh, and so I would turn folks to take a look at that. Um, I want to say something on the on the familiar portions of that text that we look at, but I really did appreciate in the moment we're living in his recognition. Yeah, which is it's important with a text like this. And if people are preaching on this, but didn't listen last week, you might want to go back where we are commenting on the passage that comes right before this. This is kind of the, the continuation of Jesus's discourse. Mm -hmm. to people he's sending out. And we talked a bit about, I think the word I used was bleak <laughs> to <laughs> describe the state of the world Jesus imagines. And we talked a bit about how to how to preach that. So, I mean, if, if you are just dropping down in it this week, you might want to go back to the previous podcast. We get no extra money for that. Just, um, no. I'm, not just I'm not just pushing content or product here, you know. No, I don't think we get residuals from additional runs, right? Additional hearings. I haven't gotten any. <laughs> I don't think we get any, whatever, what comes before residuals. I'm not sure that anyway. No, no. I, am yeah. I, am I, should I be getting something? Are you guys telling me something? No. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're not, once you're fully vested after five years, Joy, you just discover just the money gets comes rolling in. <laughs> oh, now you tell me. <laughs> anyway. We're well, avoiding Matthew 10, 24 to 39, aren't we? We are, aren't we? Well, it's one of like, so verse 26, so have no fear. It, that three times is repeated throughout the passage, you know, have no fear. Of course, we get the uh, the familiar line of take up the cross, right? Whoever does it, what, and then what does that mean? And it's another another metaphor, another invitation to what we were talking about last week in terms of what is this what is this being sent going to look like and into what situations does that, that mean? Uh, and then, uh, but I, the one place that I dropped down in this text, again, not to offer the, you know, the silver lining or the, the rosy picture, but I, uh, so do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I would, uh, if, if preachers don't know this already, I would just point them to, that him, his eye is on the sparrow, and uh, it's and uh, written by a, a woman composer, uh, reported by Mahalia Jackson, uh, and Whitney Houston, by the way, and I. Uh, but it's a it's a really beautiful hymn. The way in which it takes this it takes this line from Matthew, and uh, and and expresses what does it mean to, that God's eye is upon you. Uh, and it's, and it's a really lovely unpacking and, and expression of, of that, of that sense or of that feeling that this gospel hymn. So that's just, a, it's an aside. Why should I be discouraged? Yeah, exactly. It's a, it, yeah. yeah. It's, and it's, I played it. I remember, I can't remember what it was for, but I remember, I didn't know it. It was not a, it was um, not a hymn with which I was familiar. And this was years and years and years ago. 
And when I was still playing my violin and I was visiting my in-laws and Kareem, my in-law, my mother-in-law, uh, they wanted me to play in church. And she said, well, maybe you could play as I is on the sparrow. And I'm like, I don't know that one and had to learn it. And I've never forgotten it. It's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful hymn. My god sister sang that at my mother's funeral. And um, it's it's a powerful because like this text, it acknowledges the desperation, the discouragement, and it promises the hope that God has always promised us. And you know, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know, I know he watches me. And yeah. and when yeah. when we when we take this, I think it's important for us to remember why do we proclaim this gospel, this good news? Why do we tell this story? Why do we hold this faith? And it's based on the reality and relevance of a text that knows the chaos we are living in, but keeps the promise of a faithful God who's watching over us, who never leaves us. So Caroline, you, you kind of said, you know, you don't want to paint, you know, uh, find the silver lining in it, but that is exactly what we're doing. Um, as, as we said last week, this hope, this hope does not disappoint. And, and so that's why we can look at this reality and let the text do the heavy lifting of where we are. I sing because I'm happy. Let me stop. <laughs> oh, it's just the words are beautiful. Yeah. That's a sing yeah. because I'm free. Oh, his eye is on. The sparrow. I know I didn't hit that note. And I know <laughs> he watches me. We've got listeners who are singing along right now, and ah, it's good. That means okay. I don't have to sing in public. <laughs> I shouldn't have. I started that one too low. It's all good. <laughs> I have nothing to add about birds, unfortunately. So I, I feel I think I'm going to take the direct the conversation in a different direction, which I feel bad about. I also really like birds, but anyway, go ahead. Yes. Well, you know, the mention of like not being afraid and of course telling somebody don't be afraid is about as helpful as don't be anxious, right? Um, uh, fear is a, is a very important survival mechanism that's, you know, that's, that's helped our species get through a lot, but of course is also really dangerous for community and also maybe dangerous for other things. I'm not sure it's dangerous for faith all the time. Sometimes faith can, or fear can, can switch into faith in some gospel stories. But, you know, I think about like, where are the places in the New Testament where people are told not to be afraid? It's when angels show up. It's <laughs> when the resurrected Jesus shows up. Uh, it's Jesus also walking on water. Passage. Yeah. So, I mean, a passage like this, it's so fear is a response when you're in the presence of something dangerous or potentially dangerous or unfamiliar. I mean, I do think the resurrected Jesus is a rather dangerous presence, or at least I'm not supposed to be here would be my, you know, I'm, I've stumbled into the wrong place in the universe at the wrong time. This is like a holy ground. But uh, what's also true in all of those different kinds of passages is people's lives are about to get changed. They're about to get oriented in radically new directions when the angel shows up with news or information or a, or a commissioning when um when jesus shows up in in the the hours after the resurrection in luke and in john um in matthew but um but also here right the fear is because it isn't just people are going to be after you or life's going to be hard it's because you're being called now into doing something and your faith is going to lead you in a direction that's going to have um, danger to your well-being, perhaps. But also, it's <laughs> you're going to be in unfamiliar ground. You're going to be in holy ground. God is calling you to a different kind of existence or different way of being in the world. And the do not be afraid is, I think, always the, it's peace, right? God gives peace, or God will be with you, or you're not doing this alone. You'll be accompanied in all of this. But it's, I don't think it's like 
switch from fear to faith as much as it's yeah there's a reason for the fear because you're there's an unknown ahead what you thought was true yesterday or was ordinary or stable yesterday has become unstable so i don't know i just i'm kind of playing with that in my own mind that there's a there's a call to change or a call to hold on in all of these and it would be a stupid thing to say don't be afraid we're not god present and accompanying not necessarily protecting right but present with a person and when we remember that in the chronology of events this happens before the crucifixion so they're seeing all that jesus is doing and they're they're feeling like they're entering into the promise and i suspect hearing these words may have felt a little like oh we got this cuz cuz we're with you um and sometimes we have to hear this promise and naming of what reality is going to be so that when the reality happens and that same promise is given it's familiar you know, so it can't be like, okay, you've got this, everything's great. Oops, I didn't realize it was going to be that bad. I should probably tell you you're going to be okay. No, from Jump Street, I'm going to tell you, we got this. It's going to be hard, but we got this. So when it gets hard, that's a familiar promise that you've been given. And it's like, okay, that's right. I do know. I do know. Um, I think that's another reason to, another way to read how this is heard because they may they may not have fully appreciated it until after they went out and caused the complications that they did <laughs> i think too our conversation around this text puts an important pers- gives a, a, an important perspective to take up the cross that to take up the cross so often is connected with with suffering Right and with and and rightly so and and uh, but but it's also a commit to take up the cross is a commitment to uh, to be amongst those who are willing to resist the empire <laughs> uh, and call attention to the uh, call attention to the destruction of empire. Uh, it's to take up the cross is to identify with that kind of way of being. And, uh, and so it's a, it, it is a commitment to raising one's voice against, uh, injustice and, 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 and so that's, I, so the, yeah, that's, I, I'll just say that about, you know, take up the cross because that can mean so many different things and, and, um, but the reality is that that to which discipleship calls us is uh, that the cross is not totally theologized uh, right. as how it, that it really is a the reality of of you know the empire strikes back and <laughs> yeah. and so that's how that that we really do put it in that perspective as well. To paraphrase one of my students it's to announce that Roman crosses don't work. Mm, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the, the, yeah. the greatest tool that they have is, is, is weak. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That even Rome has limits. Even Rome's power has limits. The empire's power has limits. Yeah. I like the exactly. empire strikes back. Yeah. My nerdiness likes it. Yeah. Should we go to Jeremiah? Yes. So for me, using a term we use in our class, uh, Caroline, the function of a sermon on (laughs) Jeremiah's text could be to demonstrate how those who hope in God hold lament and praise together. Um, I find that fitting with the reading in, in Matthew. Uh, So even if one is focusing on the gospel, this concept might be incorporated there, the tension um, there. Um, But it's to to name what God already knows, 
um, Jesus in Matthew says there will be division. We acknowledge that. Um, and to acknowledge all of the anxiety that it raises, the fear that we talked about, and to remain faithful to God's agenda, to God's timing, to God's purpose, to God's plan. So it's holding intention that lament and praise, which is moving the way that, that the Jeremiah text reads. That's a good point. It, it helps us maybe frame why Jesus is saying such difficult things in, in Matthew 9 and 10, and it encourages us not to view those as an aberration or something we can overlook that aren't connected to the more peaceful moments. Uh, a lot of times in Matthew, I keep wanting to ask myself, because there's some, there's some real um, kind of whiplash moments in Matthew's yeah, gospel. Yeah, yeah. So one of the questions I always ask myself is, how is this the same Jesus who also spoke the Beatitudes? And, mm. and the Jeremiah text helps me with that because it gives a bit of an insight into the mind of a prophet and the passion of a prophet. And so we, when we lay Jeremiah 20 next to Matthew 10, we recognize maybe Jesus isn't just always meek and mild, or maybe that's not even his dominant thing. He's, there's an intensity that the Gospels might not always capture or that maybe our art or our piety filters out. There's, a, there's an intensity toward compassion and mercy. There's an intensity toward all of this. And so, yeah, I would, I, if I were preaching this Sunday, I would line these up and I would say, reread Matthew 10 in different voices. Now, now read it with a kind of a Jeremiah intensity of the fire shut up in your bones. That's how prophets I think have always been. They're not, they're not, they're not like you and I. <laughs> Are true prophets, right? Who have got this, the word of God so deeply dwelling within them that it creates just this intense, um, what's the word I want? Kind of a split in their own self, which gets expressed, like you said, Joy, in, in praise and lament, which are not necessarily opposites or incompatible, but. Well, in the way in which the way, yeah, and the way in which there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones, I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. The way in which that really is a another way to say hungering for righteousness, like you yes. cannot. It's just you know, it's exploding. It, it's that deep visceral sense of this this justice, this righteousness has to. These claims have to come out. They just I can't I can't hold them in anymore. Um, and that that does put a perspective on Jesus' ministry that I don't know that we talk about as often of that kind of, I cannot not <laughs> yeah. speak like this. I cannot not in, embody this reality or, or it, it, I cannot not say this. This is what I have to say. I can't hold it in anymore. Um, yeah. Regardless like of what the circumstances or the consequences yeah. are going to be. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is another happy June Sunday we're helping yeah. people with. Yes. Woo. Yes. We've gone a long way from singing the eyes on the sparrow. Yes, we yes. have. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, speaking Jeez. of really depressing texts, here's Genesis 21, which has its nicer parts. Or there's things that happen in it that are encouraging, but it sure doesn't begin well. Uh, as I as I look at this text, uh, I, I raise the question of how many decisions have been made in the recent past that proved to be disastrous in the present. And when I first thought it, I was saying how many decisions have been made in the past, but some of our decisions are recently made, and the the results are disastrous. And um, sometimes I, I talk about what it means to pull a Sarah. That is when you have this great promise from God and you decide to help God out as if God can't fulfill God's promises. And sometimes that's what we feel like in the waiting. And so what seemed like, okay, you know, there's Hagar, we can work with her. And then, oh, no, that this is so not what I had in mind. This is, no, this is not going to work. And, and so twice 
Hagar's going to have to leave. And um, uh, I, I appreciate the commentary. Uh, first be seen by God. And now her son is heard by God. Um, so that just so there's there's the there's the um, there's the positive in this text, but I think we have to start with a a very bad decision, where you know, in 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 um, what's the word in uh, impatience, in I think I've got an idea God hadn't thought of. Um, Sarah and Abram jump in. And, oh, this is, I mean, we're still suffering in this generation for that decision made so long ago. That's really well put, Joy. I think um, the challenge then for a preacher is explaining who Hagar is and how we got into the situation. But a good preacher can do that in three to five minutes. Mm -hmm. Um but then to sit with this text for a while and and look like you said those decisions that are made um don't be too quick to jump to the divine intervention right right which of course is beautiful and reminds us god has bigger stories bigger covenants there are other things the bible could have said or people the bible could have followed and to say a bit about genesis 16 as well where hagar already has had an encounter with this god and already named this god and uh, despite the the horrific treatment she endures, and now she and her son, God's already kind of on the hook, so to speak. Right? God has already made promises that God will, will keep. Uh, will keep to her, and it's a you know, if if to invite people into what would it be like had the Bible also followed her story a little further and Ishmael's story a little further. But there's enough here to let us know they do have a story. A promise. Yeah, it's even better than story. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, uh, you already said this, Joy, but I would point people, our preachers, to the commentary and the way in which, uh, the way in which Hagar's story, uh, and and the, but the promise to Hagar, but the way in which Hagar's story is uh, so real and mm -hmm. so experienced by mm -hmm. so many people. And so it's not, it's not just a story. It's um, if it, she, and not to make her a metaphor or a representation, but she, what she had, what she experiences and what she, what she feels is deeply experienced and felt by so many marginalized persons. And exactly. so to, to, to name that and to, uh, yeah, that people need to sit with that. Um, and, and yeah, I just yeah. think that's really important when it comes to preaching this text. And, and following along again with the commentary, I think that that question, um, uh, that is asked, um, is, is remains, um, if we are those who are bearing the image of God, which we've talked about in weeks past, um, do we hear those who are marginalized, oppressed, left out. Um, and and that, that, that question, it's a rich question because it moves from what God has done to what, what are we doing? We who claim to be reflections of God, not just in our titles, but in our tasks. And I think that commentary said it so well, but if we hear them, then we must not remain passive. Yes. Act accordingly, which is what you just said, Joy. We must not mm -hmm. only listen, but truly hear and obey, living out our faith in the world. So there's, um, and it really, and it goes back to when we first started talking about the semi-continuous reading and and how you, Matt, you challenged us and really importantly so that these stories don't, don't become, okay, now there, there was this story and then there was this story and just remember how that went and, and for the sake of some sort of biblical literacy, but the way in which these stories speak so deeply into uh, our own, our current contexts and our, our current realities, but also so 
uh, so importantly reveal characteristics about God that that we know to be true. But uh, but here we get a glimpse in these stories. We get a glimpse into these characteristics of God, faithfulness of God that that really put flesh and you know flesh and blood on on what that looks like and what that feels like. So this is a real story. This is a real flesh and blood story that should be felt and experienced and heard. And, and at the same time, you're getting, you're getting um, a sense of who God is that, that is unique, is really important. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think one way I'd put that is how do these stories still address us today? And and like yeah. you said, not as symbols. I mean, they they become such archetypical stories Yeah. Mm -hmm. and for good reason. But at what cost, right? And if they become just archetypes, then we've, I think we lose, like you said, the flesh and blood leanness or the individuality. And then and a lot of people are smart enough and intuitive enough to figure out how, how those real stories address their real lives if the preacher can give permission and, and kind of open those doors. It, uh, I've, I've said uh, somewhere that, um, that when, when, when I don't want to use the word privileged here, but when when you've been blessed, when your prayers have been answered, when you are experiencing, um, you know, all the good, that's when we forget. And it's when when we're waiting, when we're wanting that we have to be reminded. And so if you happen to be in a context or in a community that has just experienced a great blessing, this is a way to let the text do the heavy lifting to remind us of the wanting you just came out of or the community that is wanting. And it is our task, your task, to be the answer to their prayers so that they can praise God like you have. Right. Right. Otherwise, theology gets written only by the survivors. Exactly. Right. exactly. Or the victors is maybe a worse way of putting it. Which is Hagar a great will get to write a little bit of theology before they disappear. Which is a great segue, I think, to the psalm, right? In that. I, 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 which I would use, <laughs> which I would use. And, and I think that the words of the psalmist here might be the words of Hagar or Jeremiah. Or the disciples of Jesus, uh, or th from the epistle in this week, where Caroline, you said um, to to make it flesh and blood. I think the Psalms makes these gives us biblical words to put flesh on the experiences from any of the texts. I can imagine it. The, yes, I can imagine Hagar saying. Whew. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. I mean, I can I can just imagine her speaking these words, oh. every single one of these words. Yeah, yeah. And that's and that's what I would do with this psalm, where I'm preaching on Hagar. It's like I am the subject of gossip for those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. Um, and then the but as for me, my prayer is to you, O oh Lord. I just think that yeah, these are Hagar's words. She when she's like. How do I, what do I, what do I do here? What do I do here? Oh, I know a psalm. <laughs> I remember a psalm that speaks to my situation, speaks to my, what's happened to me. So I wonder where the psalmist got the psalms. Maybe mm. they're older than we think they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. You two are brilliant. That's just a great insight in how that can get deployed then that's the wrong word you know instantiated expressed maybe the psalmist copied hagar <laughs> or maybe I that experience see. is all too common all right romans romans six another oh great okay. chapter so okay here. i'm i'm, I'm going to start because i confess as a wesleyan I really appreciated the commentary because he says it's a Lutheran reading of Luther to expect the fruit of the faith of one who is justified to be good works. Uh, I, 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 I was really grateful for that. I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not 
reading this, reading Luther through a Wesleyan eye. A, a Lutheran can read this themselves. Um, but I, I would want to preach Romans in light of Matthew this week, to linger in the possibility of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, if God transforms, then we are not enslaved to our brokenness, whether that is by society or by ourselves, but that we are able to live differently for the glory of God. Um, and that, that circles back to the prophet's uh, move from lament to praise. Um, what God has done arose from my terror and my tears and has been transformed into a testimony of God's faithfulness, which might very well be how Jesus's words um, become a word of hope, even as it's predicting horror. Yeah, I uh, I like that a lot, Joy. And I think of, uh, and particularly verse 11 in the kinds of conversations that we've had for this podcast. So you must also consider yourselves dead, uh, dead to sin, and then alive to God in Jesus Christ. That, uh, that, that we are thinking of that sin, right, as not not just our personal, individual, moral, that's you know issues, but that 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 wider responsibility that obedience to God means calling out sin. Uh, in in those wider contexts or those wider realities of institutional uh, systemic sin, and uh, and to what extent that's what the nature of the cross was, right? It's calling out the sin of empire and the sin of unchecked imperial power, um, and so, but 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 in doing that, and we are that we that we are dead to that kind of sin, but then alive to God and in Christ Jesus. And, and one of the things, I mean, this is just a small thing, but like the alive there in Greek is a present, it's a verb. It's a present mm -hmm. participle. Like it's not an adjective. It's a, mm -hmm. it, you're not alive. You are living. It's just like ongoing living that this is that this whole passage is about like that death to life and that sin to life and uh, and that that's you know that's what God that's what God wants for us um, that living in a way that is living freed from sin and living freed from the power of death and uh, and and it's a way of being in the world yeah. So if sin is missing the mark, um, going back to the Genesis story of trying to help God out with fulfilling God's promises. So if, if sin is missing the mark, then it's moving from missing the mark to being it, uh, 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 in the bullseye, which is loving our neighbor, which is um, ending oppression, which is making it possible for everyone to be seen and everyone to be in the presence of God so that they can hear God's voice. Well, and for Paul, it might even be more elementally, it's, it's sin is being held captive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. by <laughs> something that forces you to do the things. So it's like the cordyceps in the last of us. Uh, it's, and it, and it's, it delights in, in death and then, and in, in spreading death. So the movement here from death to life, the movement here from enslavement or captivity to freedom, um, preach on that, right? People can preach a sermon on baptism if you want out of this that talks about what does this mean to be united in Christ's death? There's so much, so much here. <laughs>